Welcome to Capital City News, your source for staying informed and engaged with Salt Lake City government. I'm your host, Brian Young with Salt Lake City TV. For our episode today, we spoke with folks in the Transportation Department about the Livable Streets Initiative. Our History Minute is about the spooky history behind the Sprague Library. And before we get to those, let's take a look at our legislative update and our lookbacks. At its October 18th meeting, the City Council adopted the lease rate, terms and zoning for the Other Side Village Pilot Project, adopted the Ballpark Station Area Plan, and approved the state-required contract between the City, the RDA, and the Utah Inland Port Authority. And along with the Mayor, the City Council approved a measure to declare November Native American Heritage Month in Salt Lake City. To learn more about these issues or any others, please visit slc.gov slash council. The Bicycle Collective, a nonprofit that refurbishes donated bicycles and puts them into the hands of those in need, as well as the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake City, held a groundbreaking event for the Bicycle Collective's new headquarters at 901 South Gale Street. We will be able to house all our operations simultaneously. This is a first and a really big deal for the collective. We'll be able to do sales of affordable bikes, provide bikes to those in need free of charge, recycle, volunteer, have a do-it-yourself space, be able to store our own bikes on our property and have educational programming, all in a sustainably built, energy efficient space designed to be welcoming and to encourage collaboration. The future building's front doors will open onto the Nine Line Trail Corridor, a walking and biking trail along 900 South that will eventually connect East and West Salt Lake City from the mouth of Immigration Canyon to the Surplus Canal west of Redwood Road. Recently, the mayor celebrated the 1,000th tree planting of the season at Meadow Park, continuing her goals in making an impact on the west side and across the city as far as livability and green space is concerned. Today we're also, we're not just going to plant trees, we're going to learn about how to take care of them by watering them. Because every seed, that, every tree that your city is planting for you, and I mean it, all of them, they're all of our responsibility. So as a community, what do we do? We take care of each other and we got to take care of our trees too. For more information about our urban forest, visit slc.gov. Salt Lake City is in need of crossing guards to help school children safely cross the streets as they walk to and from school. There are currently paid part-time positions available now. Apply today and help keep kids safe in Salt Lake City. Visit slc.gov jobs for more information. For our interview this week, I sat down and had a Zoom call with the folks in the transportation department so they could tell us all about the Livable Streets Initiative. My name is Keegan Galoro, and I'm actually a transportation planner with the transportation division here in Salt Lake City. Could you tell me about Livable Streets, what that is, what that means? Uh, so Livable Streets, it's a program that aims to implement uh, neighborhood traffic calming in Salt Lake City, um, more, more on a citywide scale. So the program is going to use a data-driven and more like transparent, equitable uh, prioritization process uh, to create a plan to implement those traffic calming improvements um, in areas of Salt Lake City that it's like most needed. Uh, the goal of the project is to improve uh, comfort and liv livability within our neighborhoods. And the program uses uh, kind of the following criteria to determine where exactly traffic calming measures should be implemented to improve the overall safety and livability and attractiveness of our residential streets. So a, a candidate street that we're looking for um, should have a posted speed limit of 30 miles per hour or less. It should be owned and maintained by the city of Salt Lake, uh, should have three or fewer traffic lanes and uh, shouldn't be a part of a university campus or contained within a public park. Um, and it's not to be slated for improvements through any other funds uh, or any other funded program. And it also needs to be adjacent to an area within a residential land use component. What makes a street livable after a street goes through this program? Like, what is it that that sort of makes the street feel more livable in your view? So ultimately, it, it, it boils down to safety and comfort. We're looking to slow down, um, slow down vehicle traffic and keep it from uh, you know, creating noise, um, 
you know, putting, uh, it's basically about perceived safety. So when you're walking down a street, if there's cars speeding by going faster than the posted speed limit or going a speed that is, you know, in most residential areas, 30 to 35 can feel like 50. So what we're looking to do is really just slow down that traffic and, and, and make it more um, approachable for people on foot, people who may want to bike. What's sort of the timeline on this project? When, what are we, what are we looking at as far as the, 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 the timeline and the length of this project? We're hoping that this project will be uh, funded and uh, continue uh, for years to come. Um, ultimately, uh, we're still kind of nailing down the final points of this project, but the hope is to actually get started early next year. What are the next steps for you and what are the next steps for residents? So the next steps for us as a team is we're, we're, fine at, we're kind of putting the finishing details um, and design uh, criteria in for the quick build side of the program, which will include uh, an application process with a form that our, our residents can fill out to kind of request these uh, traffic calming uh, traffic calming implementations within their neighborhood. Um, and ultimately, we're going to start uh, reaching out to the community here, um, especially the neighborhood councils, and start our engagement process uh, with those first prioritized zones that we've established. Um, and like I said, in early 2023. For folks who want to learn more information about it in the meantime now, where, where, do, you, where do you send people for that? So if you want to learn more about the project and actually read the final report that we came out with on livable streets, uh, we're asking people to visit slc.gov slash livable streets. Today's Halloween, and that means it's time for another Spooky History Minute. The Sprague Branch Library originally opened in 1914 to serve the residents of Sugar House as Salt Lake City grew. It was originally located at 1035 East, 2100 South, and stood there until the new English Tudor style facility opened in its current location in 1928 at a cost of $36,000. It was constructed on a piece of land that was once part of Sugar House Park. In 1938, the American Library Association named it the most beautiful library in America. This branch of the library was named for Joanna Sprague, who had been the Salt Lake City Library System's executive director from 1903 to 1940, though her work with the library started at the beginning in 1898. She spoke at the opening of the library and was well regarded in library circles and even served as the president of the Pacific Northwest Library Association in 1928. After significant flooding in 2017, the Sprague Branch Library was closed for renovations in an effort to preserve it for future generations and prevent future flood damage. It reopened in 2021 to much fanfare and an expanded square footage. As with most historic buildings in Utah, ghost stories are no stranger to the Sprague Library. According to Linda Dunning's book, Specters in Doorways, History and Hauntings of Utah, there are reports of strange footsteps and electronics turning on and off inside the building. The book explains that this ghost is allegedly from a man who broke into the library to keep warm. After shattering a window to get in, he cut himself on the glass and bled to death. That's it for this installment of Capital City News. Remember, the best way to stay engaged is to stay informed. You can do that by following us on social media at SLCGov, subscribing to us on YouTube, or watching us on Channel 17. So reporting in from beautiful Washington Square, I'm Brian Young.